Welcome to lesson four of Engage How to Know God. In the past couple of weeks, we've learned a lot of things. First, we learned that if we're going to know God, we have to be humbled by God's eternal truth. We have to be willing to acknowledge that there is a God and I'm not Him. In the second week, we, we learned that we have to be broken to have a new heart. We have to be willing to acknowledge that we are sinful people and that we need a Savior. Last week, we acknowledged maybe the most important part, that we had to surrender to God's grace and what Jesus did on the cross. And I hope that within this past week, if, if you've been somebody that doesn't know God yet, that you've taken that step to surrender to God's grace. If you haven't, keep listening because you hear more about what the spiritual life is going to look like. And I hope over the past couple of weeks, if you've already known God when you were doing this study, that you've come to remember what God's done in your life and also have it stretch you to remember that in the future. You see, we never grow past the gospel. The gospel is the center of what we do and who we are as Christians. So hopefully you've continued to grow in that process over the past couple weeks. But we come to this next step, and for some of us, we might wonder, why are we even having a next step? You know, surrendering to God's grace kind of feels like the place that we know God. But you see, that's, that's not the end of the story. It's just the beginning. You know, you can know people in a lot of different ways. I can come to know someone, you know, just meet somebody, and that's get, coming to know someone. Or I could be friends with somebody for a couple of years and start to know their likes and their dislikes and how they live their life. Or I can know my spouse. You know, actually in the Bible, one of the words for know actually refers to sexual intimacy, knowing each other at the deepest level of who we are. So there's these levels of knowing somebody. And, and if we surrender to God's grace, that just means we started knowing God, that we started the journey. It doesn't mean we've ended. So this week and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to actually look at what it means to, to know God as we go throughout our journey of faith. And today we're going to start with the next level, which is being revived for authentic living. Being revived for authentic living. In our upper room prayer area of our church, there's this revival section, and it's where we pray for missionaries and for churches and for countries around the world so that they would have new life. Revival is a, a kind of an old term that was used by traveling preachers when they had these revivals where, where they were hoping that new life came to people. God wants to do that same thing in our lives where there's new life and that we're brought to a place of looking more like Jesus on an everyday life, authentically living like Jesus. We're going to talk a lot more about that today, but before we do, let's hear a testimony from Pastor Sean King. So my name's Sean. I grew up in a Christian home, um, always had known a lot about God. We'd always been in church uh, every weekend that I can remember growing up from a super young age. Uh, my parents were awesome parents um, who taught us a lot about God, uh, but I didn't really have a personal relationship with Jesus. I knew all the right things to say. I knew all the right times to say them, all the times to sit up and, and uh, stand up and sit down, but I didn't really have a relationship with God. It wasn't about knowing him personally. It was about just doing the right stuff. Um, so when it came time to, to step out into my own faith, um, there was no foundation there. So I, I just quickly turned to whatever I wanted. Um, wasn't living for the Lord. Uh, started getting into relationships that weren't honoring to Jesus, that weren't following, that weren't growing towards that. Um, and out of that came a lot of guilt uh, and a lot of um, just trying to earn people's respect and love. Uh, I didn't look at myself well. I knew that I wasn't living up to Jesus' standards. And so I was going around to everyone I possibly could to try and earn their, um, earn their respect, earn their love so that I could feel better about myself. And I can distinctly remember um, one day just sitting in my apartment getting ready for, for work one morning um, and just hearing Jesus say, I love you. And I was like, oh yeah, cool, you're, you're Jesus, you're supposed to love me, that's awesome. He said, no, you don't get it, I love you. I said, yeah, I, I know. And he just kept saying it over and over and over. Um, and that morning, it just brought me to tears because I, I think I had always known that God loved me as this fundamental idea, but I never really understood his actual love for me, that he cared about me deeply um, and that he wasn't just worried about me doing all the right stuff and saying all the right things and singing the right songs, but he actually cared about a relationship with me. And a short time later, um, all of the consequences of all the things I had been living that weren't for Jesus, uh, came out, um, and I just felt like I was at a super low point and had nowhere else to turn. Um, and I know people talk about where they, they turn to the Lord and it's this great experience, but mine was just complete and utter frustration, uh, where I just was driving home one day and said, I, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. I give up. And I felt like in that moment, Jesus just said, good, that's awesome. Finally, we can start doing something. 
Um, and, and it was funny that day, I just could not stop weeping. Uh, I would pull myself together what, to walk by a group of people, get into my office, and then just break down again. Um, and that just went on from that, that whole day. Uh, but after that point, I started to see that God was breaking down those things in me that needed to get things from people, needed to get value from people and, and worth from people. And it was all about just experiencing God's grace in each and every moment. Um, to know that I was his child and that I didn't need to earn anything from him, that I didn't need to earn love and respect. I had that because of who he is and who I was to him. Um, and so out of that, it became less about me trying to do the right things and trying to live an authentic life for him. And it just became about knowing him and growing with him and saying like, oh man, I, I just want to be more like you because I know what you've done for me. I know the, what you've put in my heart um, and out of that came so many passions that I didn't even know was, was, was inside of me. Um, seeing things in, in me that, that God had put there that he wanted me to, to explore and passions and desires that, uh, that he had instilled in me that I wasn't even close to understanding were there um, came out out of that relationship, out of that knowing who he was and knowing who I am. Um, and I grew up most of my life hiding in the back of the room because I didn't want anybody to see me. I wanted to hide in the back. Um, and it's not because I, I like being in front of people that, I, I, that I'm a pastor now. It's because I can't help but share the gospel and, and hopefully bring people to that same point of understanding that, that Jesus has so much more for you and so much more uh, to hold on to and to cling to. So that's my prayer for you. Humility, brokenness, and then surrendering to His grace is how we start to know God. But if we really want to walk it out after that, if we really want to know Him in our everyday life, we've got to be revived for authentic living, which is what Sean kind of testified to. The fact that he was able to be revived by God's grace to continue to live out his faith in everyday life. Now, if we're going to understand being revived for authentic living, I think we have to define some of the terms. Let's start with authentic. You know, usually authentic is a word that's used by hipsters or organizations to represent how honest they are willing to be about their faults. They're not just saying the good things about them, but the bad things, and they're willing to just be real, you know? And I think there's some of this to be said in authentic living, what I mean by that here. But I think really the, the way I'm trying to communicate this is more about authenticating something. It's about seeing the realness of it and to make sure it aligns with the original. You know, when you authenticate antiques, if you see those shows where they're kind of looking at the antiques and trying to figure out if it's real or not, that's kind of what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about authentic living. Does our faith in God affect our, our daily life? You know, if not, how is this faith even true? How is this faith real? Because God doesn't ask us to surrender to His grace just so we can continue to live out the things that we've always lived out. He, he's asked us to do that so we could be with Him forever, but also so that we could look more like Jesus on an everyday basis. To know God is to look more like Jesus every day, the next day more than the day before. But here's the problem. We're so used to seeing the world a certain way that it can be hard for us to let go of the things we used to do. Recently, I was at my cousin's house, and he said, hey, man, you got to come check out this thing in our basement. So I went down. You know, there were these cameras on the wall, and he, he gave me uh, this, this, these goggles that were attached to his computer, and he put on this program. All of a sudden, I'm in a completely different world. I mean, I'm, I'm walking around, literally walking around kind of in this different world. I can see different things. I have these handheld things so that I can pick up these objects and throw them or, or move things around or open doors. And I'm literally in his basement, but I feel like I'm in a completely different realm. And, and when I think about those virtual reality goggles, I think that's so much how it is with us being able to see the world the right way it really is. In Matthew 13, 3-9, uh, there's this connection that I see where uh, Jesus is talking about the seed, the good news, and, and his word kind of being preached, and that seed kind of falls on different kinds of soil. Some falls kind of near the road. Some fall, falls into places where the weeds come and choke it out. Some falls onto rocky soil. Some of it then falls onto good soil. And he talks about the different ways that that good news being sowed into our life kind of produces things. Again, some of it gets choked out. Some of it doesn't take root because there's too much rockiness. And I, and I think if you connected this in the same way with these goggles, it's almost like if we were to look at our lives when we come to start to know God, when we surrender to His grace, it's like God has uh, uh, taken off the goggles. You know, we've been in this particular world for a long time, seeing this fake world, this world that isn't really real, that we've lived in it, we felt it, 
but it's not the way that God designed it to be. And all of a sudden, we surrender to His grace, and He starts to take off the goggles. We start to look around at the real world for the first time. And, and as we do that, I think sometimes we can have a reaction where we get scared of it. You know, we say like, well, this is totally different than what my life was before. I don't know if I can live this way. And so we start to put the goggles back on. Or we can get kind of choked out about the worries of life. We start to pursue those old things that we always had. Maybe that addiction that we've always had seems to resurface. Or, or we still are obsessed with different idols in our lives. Even after we've come to surrender to His grace, there's ways that we can kind of run away. But that's not the way God wants it to be. See, God wants us to take off the goggles and to sit Him down and to leave Him there. And then to start to truly understand how to live in the real world of His grace. To truly live in this world understanding that He is present at all moments, that He wants to free us from every sin and put us in this place. And that's kind of where I think the term revive comes in, or being revived. Revival, like I said, is an old-time word related to kind of preaching at revivals. And the hope in those times is that this, this new life would come to us. That we would be made new. That there's something that would come into us that's transformed into what God would want. And this power resides within us when we surrender to God's grace. The Bible affirms that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. Now, the Trinity is something in the Bible that um, it, it's, it means that there's one God and three persons. That's really what it means. It's something we can observe, that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's one God. We only serve one God, but He's in three persons. And the Holy Spirit is the third person of that Trinity. He, and when He shows up in the Bible, powerful things happen. I mean, he's there from the very beginning, overseeing creation. But when he shows up, powerful things happen. In Acts 2, something different starts to happen, though. It's after Jesus has died and rose again. Acts 2 comes, what's called, what we call Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit comes and he falls upon people. You see, in the Old Testament, uh, in the older times, the, the, the Holy Spirit would come upon people for a moment. But after Acts 2, after Pentecost, when we come to know God and we surrender to his grace, the Holy Spirit would come to dwell within us. He is our conscience. He is our comforter. He's our strength. When we come to surrender to God's grace, all of a sudden we find we have strength to do things that we didn't before. We have uh, comfort in the midst of our, our pain that we didn't have before. And we are actually guided to the right things. He's the one that empowers us to look like Jesus. Like we've talked about, we can't do anything on our own to make ourselves truly better in our own strength. We must rely on His strength. So how do we become revived for authentic living? How do we ask the Holy Spirit and work along with the Holy Spirit so that our lives can continue to look more like Jesus on a daily basis? Well, let me read from Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Romans 8, 9 to 13. It says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For you, if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Important lessons from this. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in us, uh, the reality is that if we've come to surrender to God's grace, the Holy Spirit, the, the, one who was, the one that raised Jesus from the dead, can you imagine the amount of power that was needed to raise a dead person to life? That kind of power now lives inside of you if you surrender to God's grace, if you know God. And if that kind of power lives in us, that has ramifications for our everyday life. No longer do we have to go back to the old excuses because we now have power that we did not have before. The second important lesson is that we have an obligation. If we have that power in our lives, we have an obligation. And it says, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body. Our obligation is by the Spirit's power to continue to put to death the sinful things that happen in our life, the misdeeds of the body. Well, how do we actually do that? Well, first I would suggest practice spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines. We have, uh, I'm the pastor of spiritual formation here at the church, and we have this definition that we kind of use when we're talking about spiritual formation, about it being a process that God's using is to make us look more like Jesus. But in the middle of that, we say by the consistent and intentional openness to the work of God. We are changed by the consistent and intentional openness to the work of God. Again, you can do nothing to change yourself on your own, 
But if we're consistently and intentionally open to God, God will work in us. It's almost like a potter and clay. That The more that we're open to being shaped by the potter, we will begin to look more and more like how he wants us to look. We do this by consistently and intentionally opening our, ourselves to God through things like reading the Bible, praying, spending time in community with other believers, in silence, in solitude, journaling, fasting. Any way that we're intentionally putting ourselves in a place and asking God to do a work in us, he can use that to be a discipline in our lives. We have to continue to do it more and more. There's a story I tell in there about how I used to practice piano. And when I first started doing that discipline, I kind of hated it. Uh, but the more and more I practiced it, the more it became so much a part of my life. And you might find the same thing in spiritual disciplines. But I encourage you that the more you do that and open yourself to God, the more you'll start to look more like Jesus. Second, we have to step out in the power of the Holy Spirit. My son Judah, we were at a farm and there were these hay bales that you're supposed to jump from one to the next. They had it set up for kids. And so I called to him. I said, Judah, jump to the next one. And he was terrified. He just stood on the end of it, and he refused to jump. And he, he refused to do anything, really. We had to finally kind of get him down and stuff because he didn't have the faith to trust me that he could get there. I wasn't calling him to something he couldn't do. I was calling him to take this fun next step into the journey that he was on. God does the same thing with us. And yet sometimes it's uncomfortable. When God calls us to be revived for authentic living, and He calls us to something, He's calling us to something that's going to test our nerve because we can't do it on our own. And so He's calling us to a step of faith, like that trust fall we talked about, but He's calling it to us every day. And we have the opportunity to say yes or to say no. Maybe He's, he's calling you to stop watching that particular kind of media. Maybe He's calling you to start loving your family more consistently. Maybe He's calling you to, to give up the idol like money or sex or something else in your life or Maybe he's calling you to stop being selfish in a certain area of your life. When he calls you to that, that's going to be uncomfortable. But he knows it's because it's going to be the best thing for you and it's going to bring so much freedom to your life. And yet, we have the power to say yes or we have the power to say no. If we say yes, we simply ask the Holy Spirit for strength and we say, God, I can't do this on my own. Please help me as I step out in faith. If we say no, we say, I'm sticking here. Just like Judah stayed on that hay bale. I'm staying here and you can't do anything to move me. The Holy Spirit will work in us to strengthen us and to bring us to that step. But if we say no, we're going to be completely stuck until we say yes. I, I know of people that five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, they may have made a commitment to, to surrender to God's grace and to start a relationship with God, and yet at some point in that process, they basically said, I'm cool where I'm at. I'm comfortable in the position I'm at, and I don't want to go any further, God. I, I, st I don't want to look more and more like you because I already look enough like you that I'm okay with the way I am. And I'm just going to kind of coast from here on out. And the fact is, until they go back to that step where they said no, and they say yes, they're going to be stuck in the same place. And when you're stuck in that same place, it just brings bitterness, sadness, sinfulness, and brokenness into your life. And that's where that hypocrisy that is seen in Christians sometimes comes out, where we look nothing like Jesus, even though we claim big things. So as you go to discussion... I'd just like for you to discuss the practical nature of this. What does it mean to live out this faith every day? What does it mean to look more and more like Jesus every day? Do we believe that we have to be revived for authentic living? For those that are new to faith, just talk about what this might look like and ask for some advice. Some people who have been Christians, maybe you've been stuck in that place, and tonight's the night you need to change that no to a yes, and you need to start walking forward. I just pray that as, as you go to this discussion, that it would be helpful in continuing in that process of being revived for authentic living.